Hi, I'm Charlotte. Hi, I'm Greg. And together we are the Cancer Twins. Not because we're twins, but we are siblings and I'm a Cancerian. And I'm a Gemini. And we both either had or are currently going through cancer treatment. The aim of our podcast is to share our personal experience from the point of view of someone who has gone through and defeated cancer and from the point of view of someone who has just started their journey. Yes, and I found it's really helped me. And if you'd like to keep up to date with our channel content, please make sure that you share, like and subscribe to all of our social media channels, our YouTube channel and our audio podcast channels. All the details are below. And also leave us a review because it helps others find the channel. Neither of us are medical professionals. We're not doctors. We're not psychiatrists. We're just two normal people sharing our personal experience. The subject of cancer is understandably a difficult one and not suitable for all audiences. From time to time, we may use bad language. Right, well, without further ado, let's begin our chat. Hi. Hi. Right, are you in or out? In or out? You need to make a decision. You can't be knocking on the door whilst I'm doing this, like last time. Sorry. I'm oh. So when I say like I'm setting up, what I mean is I'm like trying to control my <laughs> crazy the animals. fur family here. So hi, Adam. Hi. Hey, Adam. It's really nice to meet you. Hi. Uh, yeah. Nice to meet you. Um, so, Adam, thank you so much for coming on and, and sharing your story today. So, you know, whenever you're ready, just please do introduce yourself and tell us all about your journey. So I'm Adam Bromley. I'm from sort of the South Coast. And in 2013, I was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. I had a tumour in my chest and then a, uh, another small tumour in the right atrium of my heart. So it all started in the summer of 2013, where I was just playing my sport. I was a really sporty kid. And I'd start to just get out of breath after sort of maybe running for like you know, 20, 30 metres. And then I'd get really out of breath and not be able to sort of run anymore. And then that got progressively worse and worse as, as a couple of months went on. And we were sort of going backwards and forwards to the doctors. Because I have asthma as well, they were just going oh it's your asthma you're just suffering with your asthma so it gave me some steroids or gave me some antibiotics in case it was chest infection and then sent me on my way and I was like I really don't think it's my asthma this hasn't felt like any asthma uh, problems that I've had before I don't suffer with my asthma it's under control with my um, inhaler and whatnot and so yeah we just keep on going backwards and forwards and I keep on getting new symptoms like my resting heart rate was at like 120 which obviously is Ooh well above normal and if yeah. I'd sit down for a long time and then stood up because the tumour was in my chest and it was pressing on my arteries and veins and things mm. I'd then just sort of black out and get really dizzy because the blood was taking longer to get to my head and eventually after like the third or fourth doctor's appointment we eventually asked them we said look can I please have like a chest x-ray I just want to know what's going on and they went uh yeah, I suppose it'd be nice to have an up-to-date view of your chest just to see what it's like. I'm like, great, okay, Thanks. cheers. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, don't do me any favours. Yeah. It's like, yeah, it'd be, it'd be, be pretty cool to have an x-ray yeah, like, so cool, yeah. why not? I went to Queen Alexandra Hospital in Portsmouth. We were in and out within, uh, my dad remembers, we were in and out within 18 minutes because he remembers because of the parking ticket. And if you're only there for 15 minutes, you get the parking free. So he was gutted that you had to pay an hour pay for an hour's parking for only using it for 18 minutes that is so, such a bad thing can i just oh, say? Of that. yeah yeah so yeah we, we get two thirds of the way home and then my mum or dad get a phone call and they just it's the hospital and they just go yeah we think you better bring him back in and then we we're like oh, okay great they found something it's like pneumonia or something we'll go in they'll keep me for a, the day and i'll go home later that evening it'll be fine and then you kind of know that something might be a bit more sort of serious when you're rushed into the room like obviously normally in a and e you've got wait times of like two three hours we were just straight in into a room had loads of doctors seeing me all the time and then they were like uh we're going to transfer you by ambulance to southampton and you're going to go to there get on this ambulance to southampton they were sort of wheel me on the bed and they said, we're going to send a respiratory doctor with you. Uh, okay, cool. Didn't really have the full idea of what was going on at that time. So at this point, you're 14. Yeah. So I kind of like was knew something wasn't right, but yeah. didn't think, you know what was going on. Because within myself, I felt absolutely fine. It was only when I tried to move around and do things that was the issues were happening. I didn't feel 
like I had a cold like symptoms or anything like that so just within myself I was happy as Larry the spiritual doctor was like oh do you have any questions that you want to ask me so I said yeah what's the cricket story and he told me and they didn't give you any real indication at this point they just got you in the, and you didn't you weren't told you didn't ask no you. not at this time no and then so yeah we get to Southampton and they wheel, wheel me into the paediatric ICU and then they were like all oh, right you're on that bed there I was like okay cool and then a load of nurses started to gather around me, obviously ready to come and like pick me up and move me to the bed. There was a look of shock on their face as I just topped off the bed and then walked over to the other bed and then just plonked myself down. And they were all a bit like, hang on, no, you're intensive care. That's not what you do. <laughs> you know, we're supposed to do everything for you. And they were like, right, we're going to take you in for a CT scan and all this sort of stuff. And then that was when we sort of, after the CT scan results, it sort of sewed them to us and sort of got a rough idea as to what it might be they were like right we think it's some sort of cancer they were like because of the position of it and things like that we think it's definitely going to be treatable we just don't know what it is yet in terms of knowing what to treat it with took me in for a biopsy and then because at the doctors where they thought it was my asthma they treat asthma with steroids steroids is obviously part of the cancer treatment so then that yeah. changed my tumor so when the biopsy results came back, they came back as inconclusive. Right. So it then got to the point where it was like, we can't wait any longer because the tumour in my chest was 13 by 11 by 8 centimetres. So pretty sizable for a 14-year-old's body. That's uh, pretty big, yeah. That, yeah. that is big. Um, you can't wait any longer. We're going to need to hit you with some chemo. So yeah, they hit me with this round of chemo and then they kind of went on a best-guess scenario of how it reacted to the chemo. So they were sort of CT scanning me every week or so, just saying, how is it reacted? Because they had a rough idea of what it might be because of the position of it, what they'd seen before, etc. And so, yeah, and then their best guess scenario ended up being that it was non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. I think it was a, I think there was two types of cell that it could be. One involved a long treatment, one involved a short intense treatment, and it was the short intense treatment one. I think it was T cell sort of went on that best guess, and it was quite interesting to when I went to Queen Alexandra Hospital for the first time as like my shared care. So you'd get rounds of chemo at Southampton, and you'd be there for a week having the chemo. Then you'd go home, and then when I got like an infection because my blood counts dropped from the chemo. I'd go to Portsmouth because it was closer and easier for us. I'd go to Portsmouth for them to give me antibiotics and get better before. But one of the doctors there was like, oh, yeah, my friend in Liverpool was part of your diagnosis. I was like, OK, so from Southampton to Liverpool, I've got people all over the country talking about tumours in my chest. <laughs> <laughs> it's mad. Uh, it's crazy. Yeah, it's, it's bonkers. And what, what were the feelings that you had, though, Adam, at that moment when they said what it could be at that age? It's so similar to myself. Same age, yeah. same area where there was a tumour. I'd love to hear, like, what was that like when you first heard After it? After we'd had the CT scans and the initial thing was shock. Like, I remember me and mum just crying to each other. An hour or two, I was just in shock and didn't know what to do with myself. And then we had this meeting with the doctor who went, it's very treatable. The outlook will hopefully be pretty good. And then from that moment, for the, pretty much the whole of the rest of my treatment, my mindset just switched. Like, I say, it's treatable, it's curable. Not like you're terminal or anything like that. So I was like, right, that's it. Doesn't matter what, what's going to happen now it's going to be curable so then it, should, it was then it was just a case of trying to find out exactly what it was they were like oh yeah you might get itchy eyes with this chemo lo and behold i got itchy eyes and just yeah just mm -hmm. saw it as a tick list and every every side effect that was possible and even some that weren't on the list i would would end up with so my local hospital they gave me an antibiotic which we didn't realize at the time but it turns out that i was allergic to and so i came up in this bright purple rash all over my body i looked like an aubergine and it was so itchy and so horrible i remember the first two chemos were pretty like light and weren't mm -hmm. too bad like the first two rounds because that whole time i just stayed in the hospital anyway and then it was when i had the first big hit of chemo and then from that i like i got very ill from that it's sort of probably quite similar to you in that that was the, obviously the first proper round was the illest i ever got afterwards like from that my body then obviously acclimatized itself to it a little bit sort of started to notice that my hair was falling out and yeah that sort of side of it yeah, yeah like you know going into the shower and then looking in the plug hole and there's you, you wake up and your pillow like, is, yeah, is, yeah, yeah, yeah. So exactly the same as me so for, first round of chemo 
yeah, no problems with the hair. You get through it. Then afterwards, it sort of like builds up a bit. And then you sort of start losing the hair. I got very pale. It's like my skin changed. It was like I was full of so much fluid and like water weight bloated me a bit. Nice yeah. saline stuff to flush out down there. My body was exactly the same. It just held on to it. It didn't release it. So they ended up giving me tablets that would make me go to go for a wee every like half an hour. You don't just wee into the toilet. You have to collect have it to, so you can measure yeah. it. And Test your stuff. urine every time. You can't just go to the toilet. You have to go in one of the little like container things, yeah. don't you? Yeah. All coming back to me, Adam. Yeah. They wanted me to catch poos as well. I think that was just to sort of see how my bowels and stuff work. If you like, I'm absolutely not doing that. There's no chance I am putting a. <laughs> you can take my pee, but you're not taking the poo. Yeah, exactly. No. <laughs> there are lines. There are lines. I'm not crossing that line. Um... Sorry, because you got rushed through to Southampton. They then realised it's cancer, but they can't say what cancer. So they start you on the chemo because the steroids make it difficult to ascertain. So what happened then with the rest of your journey and, and the length and, and subsequent getting the all clear, I guess? Yeah, so I would, uh, it was sort of a case of I like go in for a week of chemo and then have like a week or so at home before I then get ill because of the chemo because my immune system was so low. And then I go into my shared care and my treatment was from August 2013 to May 2014. I didn't have any real breaks during that. It was just chemo. I, I never had any radiotherapy. I never had any operations to get rid of it because the position that it was in, they decided that the risk. So yeah. part of my treatments, I got knocked out and then they'd inject my spine with some sort of chemotherapy and then having your bone marrow tested where they drill into your hips and just yeah. all that kind of really hurts the next day but like oh i had that as well my friend oh. drilling in the in the bone to take yeah, the bone I mean, marrow out there's this thing called um beads of courage that they did and basically for everything that happens you in hospital you get a bee where it was a blood transfusion a night in hospital a needle all that sort of thing and you got a bead for it and we counted them up after i finished treatment i think i've got over a thousand i don't know if you can see that oh yeah that's awesome this is the beads of courage. I, I, like I, at the time of the treatment, I wasn't overly bothered about collecting them. But my mum was like, no, we're going to do it, even if it gives me something to do. I think around or just after Christmas time of 2013, I went in for what's called a PET scan, where they inject you with like a radioactive dye to see whether the tumour is active or inactive. And even then, they did the PET scan and it was lucky it was inactive already. They said, we're still going to hit you with another, like the other five months of chemo just to be safe. And then they did another PET scan at the end and like it had started to calcify around the outside, which they said is a really good sign that it's not going to grow. I'm not going to spread anywhere else. And then, yeah, in May, had my last treatment and then got ill for the last time after that. And then in June, they said, right, your treatment's finished. You're now in remission and you can sort of sort of live your life as normal but obviously as any cancer patient will tell you it's never normal i mean we spoke to jordan last week in scotland and she didn't even have a children's ward at all greg obviously was at the royal marsden in sutton where there is an entire children's ward and then there's an adolescent wing within that your situation was a bit different wasn't it because of your eight you were in a funny age bracket where yeah so for me, uh, Southampton, where I had the chemo, they have a, P a ward called PM Brown, which is like the kids' ward. And then literally the week that I got in and like got diagnosed effectively, they had just opened this brand new, brand spanking new Teenage Cancer Trust ward, all single bedrooms. You don't have to share a room at all. I was like, oh, sweet. Can I get transferred up there? They were like, no, you have to be 16. I was like, oh, okay. It's because uh, because the age range was 16 to 24, because it went all the way up to 24. They were like, we can't really go lower than 16 in terms of our age range. Where I was still on the kids ward, there was this four bed bay in the middle of it, which was tiny, like literally so small. Brilliant. I'm in this four bed ward with three other crying babies. Fantastic. That's keeping me oh, up. Oh, God. I hated the wards, Adam, as well. It's disruptive enough uh, with the nurses coming in 
and giving you your meds. It's so hard on the wards, especially if you're a light sleeper. Depends on the night. Some nights I'm a really heavy sleeper and I'm not waking up for anyone. And then other nights I just couldn't get to sleep at all. In this four bed ward, it was so small that the parents who were with the kids, there wasn't even space for a bed for them. But next to you, there was just this recliner chair. They let them use the beds on the day ward to sleep in overnight. You know, the charity Click Sergeant, they had a house outside the hospital, which they would have a certain amount of beds for the parents over there as well. So sometimes they'd manage to get a room there whilst I was in and they'd go and sleep there for the night. The actual charities, especially around cancer and what they actually do contribute. I mean, we, we've mentioned quite a lot of charities on this, haven't we? And there's so many different aspects where obviously the NHS only goes so far yeah. and the cancer charities in particular but there's lots of other charities of course that really do pick up the pieces with regards mm-hmm. to I mean even you just said teenage cancer trust ward yeah. that, that, that's a charity ward and obviously we've all met because of our activities with cancer research the charities that are involved with helping people with cancer or their families or the research, you know, and are propping up the NHS in that respect. We really can't undersell that. That is a huge part of everybody that we've spoken to's experiences. Yeah, massively. I mean, you know, I've been either helped or benefited from so many charities both at the time and since whether it's through like at the time Click Sergeant helped us we needed to do some uh, we needed a radiator in one of our rooms in the house because it had a we had a really bad damp problem and like we just didn't have the money to do it at the time especially with still having to pay for the car park at, at the hospital for a week which like you know isn't cheap so having to do that side of it and that luckily click sergeant would then give us the money to do that and then since having treatment i think it's more a case in childhood and teenage cancer but there's so many charities that allow you to go on holidays and things like that after i was in hospital on christmas day which is obviously rubbish boxing day afterwards we were like oh this this is the worst like let's just look up all the charities and things like that and holidays that we might be able to get after treatment and just applied for them all expecting one or two to come back and say yeah come on our trip 90 percent of them came back and said yeah i've done make a wish i've done ellen mccarthy cancer trust which takes on sailing trips i'm still involved with to this day there's a trip called dream flight we take 230 kids who have had life threatening illnesses or injuries and things like that to orlando you go to a hilton hotel and you don't you do the customs at the hotel so when you go to the airport the next day you just go straight to the hangar and on the plane they take over a whole BA plane and then when you get across to America they shut all the roads and you get a police escort to the hotel and you don't queue for any of the rides at Disney you just jump straight on or and like in some cases they'll let you go around two three times and just stop and make a queue wait and you're just sat there just having an unbelievable time like the youth worker on the teenage cancer trust ward who was like in charge of taking people on the trips like obviously you missed out on being able to be on the board, but we don't want you to miss out on the support afterwards. So I was able to go to St. George's Park where they have conferences and stuff around fertility, mental health, sleep and things like that. And it's a really, really good event. I mean, if there's anyone listening to this that has that's sort of my or was my age, like 18, 19, and it's linked to like a teenage cancer trust ward, ask them about Find Your Sense of Tumor because it's a, it's a really useful and great event Um, yeah that sounds amazing and I think it's really important to talk about these things because a lot of people don't know what is out there and the aftercare as well because I think both Greg and I well I've only just started to to realize in the last couple of weeks I would say but, but obviously my journey is pretty new still but I know Greg has talked about a lot as well that actually a lot of the time a lot of the struggle comes afterwards it's yeah. these different mental, physical, other challenges are the more long term. And it's almost like when you're sort of just so focused on getting through what you're getting through, you can hold it together. And yeah. then it's almost like once that storm's passed and you just breathe and then you realize what has just happened or you know what you're still going through when you're on treatment and it's like you just sort of you're just getting through it i remember watching um i don't know if you've watched it but michael buble went on uh the he did the carpool karaoke with james corden for stand up to cancer and i remember at the end of that because his son had cancer 
and he said during treatment like I was the one that sort of kept the family going and then as soon as treatment finished the roles between him and his wife just flipped he was the one that crashed and so that's why he took a break from like touring and all that sort of stuff and then it's flipped and she brought him back up and I just thought that was a sort of a like, an interesting thing to see just even from my parents side but one side of it that I'll never understand because I was from the other side I was just sort of sat there trying to get through it um so yeah but in terms of um yeah so obviously it's strange because obviously I was on that other end in the sense that I would be that visitor to the children's ward who was not going through it and trying to be there for you Greg Mm -hmm. and also I felt a lot of that um responsibility I guess is the best word for it I don't know if there is really a good word for it it really affected me seeing how unwell some of these children were it was really emotional to not show it because when I came in we were like you know hanging out with the other kids too because I was 17 I was allowed to stay overnight with in the kids, you know, and um, I'd go in the adolescent room and we'd do your homework and the other kids would sometimes join us. And then I'd start like, we would do art projects together, if you remember, Greg. And Yeah, and we had pizza parties and stuff and it, it was really nice. And yeah, you had to sort of really stay strong. If you're enjoying our content, Please ensure that you like, subscribe to all of our social media channels, our YouTube, and download our podcast. Equally, if you've got a story that you'd like to share, please reach out as we'd love to hear from you. The downside of all of these fantastic opportunities you had and activities was that you, of course, met so many others in your position, but then later on, not everybody made it. Mm -hmm. On the ward met lots of people whilst having treatment because some people you'd see both at Southampton and Portsmouth like you'd get ill at the same time so you'd go in one of the people that I got really close to there was a family who met it was their five-year-old girl who was the one that was going through the treatment and uh, I was almost felt like a big brother to her in that I'd go and sit in her bed and watch Frozen with her and I'd like you know just entertain her for a while and then that kept me entertained because she was so sort of young and full of life and really excitable like that was just quite fun for me and but obviously I loved having friends that were the same age as me but often people who are my age are less likely to be some days they will be really low and I'll go I'll pop my head in and they'll go no I don't want to see you today it's like okay no worries I'd have this girl she called Phoebe I'd have her to go and you know cheer me up if I was having a rubbish day and but unfortunately she passed away and so that you know going to a five-year-old's funeral when you're 16 who you've been so close to and she only lives sort of 10 minutes up the road it was yeah tough yeah it's, that's hard that's a hard pill to swallow isn't it and then yeah meeting lots of people on trips who would then relapse and unfortunately would have made it I think the, the number of people I met that have passed away is like in the like of 10 plus and like you know half of those I went to their funerals and things like that which at the age of some of them are sort of like not long after treatment when I was like 15 16 is a very young age to be going through that and although at the time sort of going through college I wasn't necessarily thinking about it consciously in the forefront of my mind there was definitely something going on in the background of having like survivor's guilt and thinking, yeah. well, why didn't I make it? And why didn't, why didn't they, why don't they get the opportunity to go on more trips? And why didn't they get to the opportunity to live the rest of their life? What might they have done? There was one girl who got into, I think it was like the Royal College of Ballet or something. I was like, imagine if she had still been around and the career that she could have had doing that. So although I wasn't thinking about that consciously in my head at the time, it was definitely subconscious and it meant that with my college work and things like that, I'd be sat at a laptop screen just looking at it going, I don't know what to do, I don't want to do it. And it meant that sort of later in my college or like toward the last couple of months, I just spent sort of catching up with all of the work that I had not done because I just sort of sat there not knowing what to do with myself, but not consciously having any, not consciously having any mental health issues, but there was clearly something going on. Like I wouldn't have classed myself as somebody who was like depressed or having any mental health struggles because I did have lots of good things going on in my life luckily at the time and I used sport as a massive outlet for 
quite forget about whatever's going on in the world. But yeah, it did have like a knock on effect in terms of how I behaved. Yeah. Yeah. I so hear that and I so empathize with it. So from what you're saying, it's, it's exactly the way that I felt. It, it came out with me, I would say, when I was maybe starting university. So maybe yeah, it was like the bottling up the trauma. And you say, look, the survivor's guilt, right? 100%. I, I was at a, a Macmillan meetup and they were saying that for every one of you who survived, 250 children have died. That's how many, you're one in 250. That feeling of like, yeah, like how come I'm here? Why Why didn't they get a second shot? I really, really get that. And you don't process it. It does stick in the back of your mind. And it does creep back up on you, I think, as as you, you know, I think it always gets better. But it sort of always, uh, it does sort of stay with you, I, I think. It's only then later you start to realise. And then as you say, the survivor's guilt comes in and then not processing what's actually happened to you and, and the stress and the anxiety. In the initial year after my treatment, it was I was in year 11, so I was doing GCSE. So I think I was sort of quite lucky in that regard that I had so much focus on that. And, and catching up on the work that I'd missed in year 10. You were actually quite good at like doing some work whilst you are on treatment. I was absolutely horrendous because I just used school as a social event. I didn't focus in any of the lessons. <laughs> yeah, there were teachers on the ward. If they came round to my bed, I'd pretend to be asleep so that they'd move on to the next one. And just... You know, there were days that I wasn't feeling well. Like, luckily, I had sort of, I had Charlotte to sort yeah. of, I was going to, I should clarify as well. Yeah. I was a pretty tough taskmaster. I was <laughs> after college specifically so that I'd be like, right, you've got to do your homework. Yeah. And I would make him do his homework. And he didn't always want to do his homework. And we did end up doing a lot more art homework than other homeworks because right. I didn't want him to fall behind. And I knew deep down he didn't want to fall behind and he needed that. It's a really strange situation with Greg and I because I was 17, but I kind of took a bit of a role of a mum as well as a Yeah. Sister. I was like a friend, sister mum and some and it just yeah. depended on what greg needed at the time, at the time. yeah we and on lots of holidays during the treatment like you you get these opportunities like we went to thorpe park i think and we went alton, was it alton, alton towers we and both, yeah so i was always the one that was like <laughs> I could be a designated adult quite helpfully, but I could also be a sort of peer because I was only three years. So I ended up doing like multiple roles. And and I guess that's when the other kids as well would start to join us with things. And I grew up really fast. I then started working for the BBC in the news department with people my parents' age or older. And so weirdly, I went from, in that year, I went from what I would say is a normal 16 year old to a super mature like adult um, overnight. But I think it was partly because of what we were going through. I mm. kind of had to do that and have that balance between like, yeah, but Greg, you do actually need to do your homework. Like you don't want yeah. this to ruin your life. You know, you've got That's to it. keep going. But I think Charlotte didn't ever want to give up on me. Because I think it was it was difficult for our parents and they they would happily just have let let me get on with it and let me drown. And the same at school, the, the difficulties I had was the teachers are very much the same. There was only one teacher that like believed in me as my physics teacher. I was always quite good at physics, but if my homework slacked or whatever, and I can remember I did a mock exam. So again, I was going through GCSE, so same as same as you, Adam. And he sort of took me off the class and he said to me, like, look, I know you're going through a lot, but you know, you are literally two marks off a C. And considering how much schooling you are missing, he said, you can easily walk out of this with good GCSEs. He said, you're bright. And he said, so try to focus like try not to get distracted and mess around with some of the other boys and he believed that I can do it and I did come out with actually really good considering I came out of really good GCSEs obviously the help of Charlotte with that tough love 
pushing me but then also just having just having one teacher believe that I could do it it meant an awful lot but the school has like iPads and they were like like you have an iPad or anything they were like oh we can use one of the school iPads for the year and then when I went back into school like the year after once I finished treatment they said look we understand that obviously this year is going to be really difficult for you. We really want you to be successful. So we think it would benefit you. And we, we agreed as well. that like, So I ended up dropping two of my GCSEs that were really coursework heavy that I, that they had sort of done all most of the coursework in the year 10 that I'd missed. So I think it was history and RE that I dropped. I loved history. History was one of my favorite subjects, but because they've done so much coursework, they were like, with all your coursework and your core subjects like science and English, whatever, you're just not going to be able to catch up as, as effectively. So I dropped those two subjects and then used those three periods to catch up with work that I'd missed from the last year on my other subjects. And yeah, still came out with six Bs and two Cs in my GCSEs, and which was more than enough to get me into college and get me onto so that good next college. Step. So I find myself back in a school as a secondary key teacher. So <laughs> so you obviously did enjoy your time at school a bit then. <laughs> right, yeah, or, or I'm making up for the time that I missed, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> it's a, such a fine balance. And I found that really hard because there would be times where Greg just didn't want to do it. And that was OK, you know, or couldn't do it, you know, then that's fine. But then there were other times where I knew... I would say to him, you know, you can always just repeat a year. And he was really like adamant, like he did not want to drop down and repeat a year. He did want to go to college or, or, you know, do A-levels and he did want to go to uni. And so then I was like, well, then you got to do it. Get your head down. Yeah. And that that's what my mum my always kept saying is like, like, oh, yeah, it's fine. You can just retake a year. I was like, no, I don't want to retake a year. I had two A's, A star, and pretty much the rest were C's. I think I got one B in maths in the end. And that got me in like you to, to a good sixth form college. How weird life is, because at the time, you know, I... I was working, as I said, at the BBC, you know, I was doing night shifts in the news department, wanted to be a journalist, then would go to college and would see you. So I was doing all these crazy things. At the time, I just did it. I was like, it's fine. Now I look back and like, I don't know how I did that. But weirdly now, you know, in my life as well, I'm back full circle teaching at university students. So it kind of prepped me. And I wonder, because it's impacted my life as well, in a way that I guess you just take for granted at the time. As as we've said, you kind of get through it. You do what you need to do. And then life goes in different directions and it sort of reflect. I have cancer technically. I mean, I hope I'm free of cancer. We've removed the tumour. There's no evidence it's spread. So, you know, touch wood, I'm going to say I'm cancer free now. But I've, I start my radiotherapy on Monday. I haven't had my treatment yet. You know, my ongoing treatment, my hormone treatment hasn't started. None of it. And having gone through what I went through with you, Greg, not only did it change my life in those ways that maybe I wouldn't even be teaching now, but also just from the point of view of, I don't think I would have dealt with it as an adult as well if I hadn't had to deal with it on the other side with you as a child or a teenager, you know? The terrible thing about being a teenager with cancer is it it is you're a teenager with cancer, okay? You don't need to unpack that. Everyone realizes when you're a teenager, you've got your whole life ahead of you and it feels so unfair. And it's just the time where you want to get sociable, you want to get out there, you want to do things. But then on the flip, I guess, from a mental point of view, once you've been told you can do it, you have ultimate belief. You don't even question it. You kind of get on with it and you get through it in a way that when you're an adult, they don't mince their word. They told me, okay, so you're probably going to be infertile, especially if you have to have chemo. And they straight away just unpacked everything that might happen to me. And the week after the wedding, I was like, oh, I was just about to start for a family and I might not even, you know, make it. It's heartbreaking, isn't it? And whilst we're on the topic of fertility, like Adam, I don't know about you, but when they were saying to me, just why I asked you about the sort of potential side effects, as they said to me, yeah, your chemotherapy, you're going to have to have radiotherapy. I didn't even really understand. And 
then explaining they're like yep you're gonna have a, a hickman line so i didn't have the pick i had the one straight in the chest and they said yeah you're gonna have the scarring uh we're gonna need to take bone marrow from you just in case uh we've removed the tumor but you're gonna have to have the chemotherapy but they said that it was an 80 percent chance that it would make me infertile i remember i had to very awkwardly go to hammersmith hospital to actually save semen just to give me a chance when i'm older if i want to have children i hadn't quite gone through that point of beauty yet where like i was able to sort of donate semen and then they even sort of because they then realized after they had the conversation with me that that was something that i might have to do they were like oh actually because we couldn't wait any longer we've actually already given you that first round of chemo so there's no point taking that sperm sample now anyway have the treatment and wait and see afterwards and then luckily i've had sort of conversations with my consultant since then and she seemed to think my fertility hopefully with the amount of chemo that i've had i've just underneath the sort of threshold as to where it might become an issue so fingers crossed that I'll, I'll be all right later down the line when i do want to have kids like i'm only 23 at the moment so it's not really on my anywhere near my radar at the moment but when i get to that point hopefully everything will be fine but i think that's just sort of a a wait and see scenario really i was i was actually okay so i i have got like i actually had a conversation very recently with my consultant because i they wanted me to do another test now that i sort of have hit my 30s and good news was as they said look like your your count is a bit lower not much a little bit lower than 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 average however you've got good quality and they said that that it's probably reduced the count just because of the chemo so that's the thing at that age i felt like i went through puberty again after i finished my chemo i'm confident for you yeah and like i saw sort of speaking to obviously you know charlotte's going through all of her struggles in terms of children at the moment and that like if it did come to it that i was infertile and like, I wouldn't be against the idea of like, adoption and that side okay. of it as well. So, And we talked living... about that because that's what I said to Adam is that obviously because I'm at this awkward age where I am already 35, it, it potentially my own natural fertility is going to lapse. But also because I'm not going to be far enough over the cancer, they're not going to consider me for adoption. So unfortunately for me, it's like a much bigger part of my journey than I hope it is for both of you because I guess then talking again about the slight positives is that because you were at that young age, your body could recover, yeah. pop back. And now this far down the line, you're both in remission or, you know, signed off as it were, and just getting checked and you're both perfectly eligible for adoption and you're both probably at going to, and I hope you will have your own kids anyway, one day. So there's a blessing for you right there. And I, I don't know what you whether you had, Greg, but just having my first glass of tap water without having to boil it and then cool it first because you can't drink water straight from a tap is an amazing experience. <laughs> Always, yeah, it had to be bottled water, of course. Still going into appointments every three months, and then it turns every four months, then six months, then yearly. And then I think it was last year I got had the meeting where they said, right, you only need to come in now for every five years for a heart scan and then even that you can do through your GP. It was kind of a weird thing in that I kind of enjoyed going back in in, a, in an odd way. Like I enjoyed going back in to see the nurses, to see the doctors, just to say hi and also reassuring to just be able to go in and for them to go like this is what's going on at the moment you're all good so that kind of almost release out into the world was a bit daunting at first but i think i'm sort of a bit more used to it now a year later it's a real weird one wasn't it that that one day then you finally finish your chemotherapy and as you say like you're released out into the wild and it's like cool well off you go now we'll uh we'll check in with you sort of every six months firstly and then it'll go to a year and then, you know, now it's biannually for, for me. I very much similar case to you. My my heart has to be checked forever now. Um, kidney functions and my heart. It was a strange feeling. It was like that sense of like freedom. And it's like this part is is over. But then 
in a weird way, as we sort of touched on, that there is that you then have to start processing the, the trauma and the grief, I think, because yeah. there is a lot of grief going on around you. And then whilst you're in that moment trying to get through it, obviously you sort of just, you know, tunnel vision, I need to get better. About the psychological challenge where you are really relieved and pleased to be free of it and to start your life and like, yes, it's over. But then there's also that, that was a really huge part of your life. And then it's like, I don't know about letting go of those, that routine and those connections you made with the nurses and the other kids. And so it's kind of conflicting and it is a weird adjustment. And I know not everyone can deal with it. I mean, it's a bit like when you have, people who go to jail for so many years and then they're suddenly just like off you go they're you know they're just dumped out the front and and they're suddenly like well what do I do now I don't know what to do yeah a hundred percent and that's why a lot of a lot of criminals end up recommitting because they can't be integrated back into society so they end up back in prison Yes, exactly. And you, you don't actually plan for that, do you? Because at the you're so in the moment and you're trying to get through your treatment. And I think at the time of going through something like this, you, you're just trying to appreciate everything day by day. And my uh, karate sensei, Adam, was on here, um, Julius, and he was saying he just takes everything day by day and just the practices, the appreciation. It's like, I've got another day on this earth. When you're going through chemo and battling cancer you, you're pretty much taking that attitude i'm i'm here for another day i'm appreciating all the small things that maybe others take for granted but then you don't actually think about oh god well what am i actually gonna what do i want to do with my life afterwards right because all all of that goes on goes on hold yeah and you you're in an environment where everything's done for you like the drop of the hat, someone will do something for you because they, even if they're not nurses and they're people coming in to visit you, they want to help because they feel so desperately bad for you. They'll literally do anything for you. So like, I remember there was one night on the ward where, because uh, you get like weird food cravings when you're on chemo, there was one night where I was just like, I want egg. I want, I want a boiled egg. It was like nine o'clock at night and my mum was like, well, we don't have any egg. So she was hunting around the ward. Like asking people whether they had any eggs and like, like gave us an egg and I had I had bought eggs. Adam, this story happened to me. This literally happened to me. So mine when I just started chemo, it was banoffee pie. Oh, and then- I mean, I love <laughs> pie. <laughs> it, it, it was banoffee pie and I didn't want to eat anything else because I felt really rough. Yeah. And again, it was probably about nine o'clock at night. And I had my mum and dad literally like driving around the whole of the area, every shop to see if they had an offy pie. And they finally, they finally got me one. They finally got me a banoffee pie. But then afterwards, it made me so ill and I couldn't eat for years. It was so, because it was so rich and like Mm -hmm. all the cream and I literally hadn't eaten all day and I demolished this whole banoffee pie to myself and Mm -hmm. I couldn't eat. They want to wait on your hand and foot because they they do feel so awful for you. (laughs) Same with the nurses, like, what do you want? You know, anything. It's like, yeah, cool. Go get me a banoffee pie. (laughs) Yeah, I could never touch any of the hospital food. That was one. I told all of my friends sort of straight away I wasn't bothered about them knowing and like lots of my friends it, it kind of really showed me who my real friends were are at times as well some just didn't message me at all and then some who didn't expect to message you message you some would come to visit me in hospital it does show you the best and the worst it really does on rotation i think there was like eight of them they each had a different night that they would cook a dinner for my family and they'd, they'd bring it over and we'd put it in the freezer and so then it took that weight off of my mum and dad. Like they, they had fresh meals cooked for them every night because people just wanted to help. I'm sure you talked about previously on other podcasts in sort of life after cancer. One of the sort of mental health side effects of it is is that any any slight cough or any slight lump, oh, lump just go. You just think the worst. Immediately think the worst. It could be a cough that's literally lasted for thirty seconds, and you're yeah. like, oh, it's back. It's back. That's Literally. it. I mean, it's, I mean, it's sometimes than others. I think, you know, sometimes I can tell my, I'm like, no, this is just a cold, I'm fine. But then there'll be other times where I'm like, oh, this feels different to my normal cold. Just every small tweak, you're like, oh, that's it. It's just back. 
don't think where I've had so many friends that have relapsed and some have made it after their relapse as well. It's like one of my really close friends, Ryan, he relapsed, he had a bone marrow transplant and then and then came back. So he's all right now, yeah. You're so right, Adam, and that's my biggest fear is that it comes back and sort of having seen seeing Charlotte having to go through it as well. It has been really tough on me these past couple of months. There's always that paranoia. I'm going through it all the time at the moment as well because I haven't started my radiotherapy yet. Every time I get a twinge from where the surgery was, where my lump was, did twinge. I think, oh, is that the nerves coming back to life? Or or is it a cell they haven't caught? It's always present in the back of your mind. Once you go through something like this, it never fully leaves you. It's always a worry. You're suddenly aware of it and you're aware of your immortality. And yeah, it's um, it's quite heavy, really, isn't it? Yeah. Money, but because I obviously have used all these charities, I want to do something to help those charities afterwards because I don't feel like I can sit here now and be perfectly fine and then not give back to those charities. So I've done loads of like fundraising things since. I've been doing things through all the cancer research since around 2014. I started with them and then it was more then linked on to when they opened the Kids and Teens Fund. I sort of helped them sort of head up and open that. The opening party was at 10 Downing Street and there was like a children's cancer survivors choir. That was Stand Up to Cancer. I did a skydive for Make a Wish. We did a charity quiz. So they have volunteers on the trip for Ellen MacArthur. It's a youth advisory group now where we basically just have a little bit of a say as to what the actual trust does. We're planning a, a concert for Ellen MacArthur. So there's all these things, but I don't know why, but sometimes when I ask, I feel terrible asking people for money, even though I know it's for a charity and it's for a really good course. But I'm like, I'm doing another charity thing. Would you mind donating money to this as well? And I just feel, I don't know, like, even though I know it's beneficial and I'm sure they absolutely don't mind, like, a tenor to them it, it, in the long grand scheme of things, especially some of these people, is just not, not nothing and they're really happy to help. Still feel like, oh, I'm asking them for more money. You know, I, I find it really tough. It is, it's really it, it's awkward, isn't it? But I, I think it's great what you're doing. Um, I think it's important to, to give. The, the Charlotte and I are sort of trying to get more involved as well. We've just done... We just done a hundred miles for cancer research and uh, breast cancer. Now we're trying to effectively give to the community. Essentially, this is a platform as a as a safe space and essentially to to help people who don't have the support network. We just really hope that this helps people. That look, you're not you're not strange. These feelings are normal, and everything you, you said, Adam, all of it is so aligned to every single person that's been on here so much of your story is so aligned to what happened with me it feels like it's a very similar experience greg and i have a weird situation having been that other person gone through it with greg at a young age now to still be technically young for what i've got so then greg to be in that role and to have had each other and to understand it's a really bizarre situation and, and in a way it's given us such great perspective and insight and so it's helped us and I guess the hope is that it will help others as well and not just the people that might be going through it but those loved ones because we've both now been the loved one as well of the other person that's close to us. I, I understand why there are so many people that are in our situation that don't like to share their story and like I know some people that have, have gone through treatment and then they've finished and then they're like right that's that part of my life done I don't want to touch on it again um whereas I'm like I love having the opportunity to even though it was eight years ago now to use platforms to tell my story and that if I can use that to do good whether that's helping support people like whether through mm. things like this where people are listening to it going through the same thing at the same time or whether it's full cancer research to help raise money and funds for them yeah. and none of us would be mm. here today without the research that they've done on cancer and well, well that's it isn't it firstly it's, it's great that you've been able to be so open about it because it, it took me time i'm not gonna lie it, it did it was just sort of quite traumatic i was very much ashamed 
of um, how I looked, the treatment, the cancer, you know, I always thought there's something wrong with me. And it did take me a long time to, to, to sort of really come out about it publicly. And that's when I partnered with, with Tom and I thought, look, I need to give back because there are other people here who have had it worse. And I responded exceedingly well to the chemo. I was well enough to go to school. I got through my GCSEs. I've gone off to go to university and you know got got a career that's the message is like look there is light at the end of the tunnel but that was the outlook uh, that I developed afterwards the fact that I am still here and I'm able to then share that story to do good afterwards is, is great we're lucky to be here really grateful to the NHS and really grateful to these great cancer charities that are here for us what advice would you give to, to anyone else starting this sort of journey? It's about to give advice to people who are on treatment now. I guess it would be find those distractions, find those things that bring you happiness and make you forget about the treatment that's going on at the time and just do it as much as you can. So for me and you, that was sport, right? So whether that's movies, whether that's just going out and having a coffee with your friend, just just go and do it because it's going to make your life so much easier the less you're manifesting these problematic thoughts if you go and have that outlet so i guess it's have that have that outlet ready for you absolutely you need something to keep going whether that's reading the sport um julius it was his cars and karate as well so yeah you, you need those hobbies to, to keep you going yeah you need as you say have a positive outlet if i were to like relive my life i wouldn't change it because there's so many things that i've done since then that i never would have experienced never would have done had i not had cancer as i said like we couldn't afford to go skip like it wasn't something that our family mm -hmm. did so being able to have that opportunity especially as somebody who's really sporty was just incredible look it's been an absolute pleasure Adam, we'll definitely stay in touch. And yeah. um, I hope you enjoyed it as well. Oh, yeah, I loved it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely loved it. Yeah, it's good. Thanks so much for your time. Yeah, all the best. Oh. Bye. Thanks, Adam. Speak Bye. soon, mate. Bye bye. Adam is currently a PE teacher and he's also a teenage cancer survivor. Adam was only 14 when he was diagnosed with non Hodgkin's lymphoma. The same age as myself when I was diagnosed. Early on in his journey, Adam had the opportunity to do some amazing activities. From various charities, Dream Flight, Click Sergeant, Ellen McCarthy and Make-A-Wish. These activities included ski holidays with his family, trips to Disney Orlando and even a visit to 10 Downing Street. Since then, as an adult, he tries to give back and raise awareness and money for an array of charities, including Stand Up For Cancer and being part of their choir for cancer research, becoming a youth representative for Ellen MacArthur, and even did a skydive for Make-A-Wish. If you're enjoying our content, please make sure you like and subscribe to all of our social media channels. Equally, if you've got a story that you'd like to share, please reach out as we'd love to hear from you. If you are someone who is a young person dealing with cancer or know someone that is who could benefit from some of these charities activities, we'll leave all the details below.